Welcome to today's episode of The Square. I'm super excited for today because uh, we get to talk to Dylan Wells. Your official title is manager of the model shop, but I, I definitely think of you more as like, maybe we can retitle you as model shop guru and all things that get physically created or something like that because you, you, it just, you, you do so much more than just the model shop. Um, but we're going to be talking with Dylan a little bit about how the model shop uh, idea and maybe even philosophy has kind of evolved over the last 20 years. And then um, the importance of something like a model shop when you're going through a, a pandemic like we are. Um, so, Dylan, thank you for being here. Yeah, of course. Glad to be here. So, and I love your background. I'm jealous. My workshop never <laughs> looks that organized. <laughs> so it's, it's taken a while. So tell me a little bit about, um, you know, the, the idea of a model shop and, and how you became the manager of the Corgan model shop. Yeah. So, you know, in, in kind of the past and history of Corgan, we had a modeling space and, you know, we know that throughout school when we're trained as architects or even interior designers, modeling is, a, is an important thing that we do that comes alongside in our design uh, process to support our designs and make us all around better designers in general. And as soon as we kind of, you know, entered the stage of expansion and, you know, what does the, col the Corgan culture look like and how, you know, how are we going to best utilize not only our employee employees' talents, but also just the skills and resources that we can provide um, to elevate our design and one of those was physical modeling and we knew that you know we wanted to increase our modeling capabilities um, also better introduce them into our overall design process from um, smaller to bigger projects different things of that nature um, so yeah we we already had the space allotted with that expansion and we kind of left it just raw and vacant for the for the first bit and we formed a committee um, with you know, employees from each sector of, of our studios who have modeling interests um, and experience. And we kind of collaborated for a couple months on, you know, what does this thing look like? What does it want to be? What resources do we need to purchase and make available? What processes do we have to put in place? Um, and so that continued on for, for a couple months and uh, many conversations with many different people. And it came down to, um, this is definitely something we want to advocate for and push. We definitely see the value in this um, in bringing the digital and physical realm together. And it's worth saying that during this whole time, you were a uh, you know, a project architect in the aviation industry. Like this was not something you were specifically hired to do originally. Yeah, so I came to Corgan um, in architecture and spent uh, two years basically in aviation. Um, doing strictly aviation work. Um, definitely loved that studio, learned a lot there. And I think it was during that time that I really saw, um, since we did have a few 3D printers at the time at the firm, um, I, I saw usefulness even then in how we could leverage this technology and model make within the studio. There wasn't a whole lot of that happening at the time just because no one had really stepped in to kind of optimize the process and really look into that in ways that we could push it. But um, once once we did, people really started getting on board and um, the interests kind of came up and people that you never would have thought would have had interest and experience kind of started doing things and approaching me with stuff. And um, it was a really, really unique experience to see it on that end and not just from like, a oh, you know, we're doing this, figure out a modeling way. It was more hey, we want to do this. It's not really being done right now, but we're we're interested in the resources and kind of adopting this approach. It's funny. I remember in the the version before our Corgan building as it is now, you know, before we did the addition, it was, it was kind of back in a forgotten corner um, and was something that, you know, uh, was used occasionally, but it wasn't something that was, um, to, to what you said, used the way, it could be used. And now, I mean, it's front and center. There's there's a whole glass street front to it. Um, and, and really putting that forward, not just in in concept, but in physical space, uh, it, it, that, that seems like a, a really intentional decision. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, what we really looked into with this whole modeling endeavor, you know, collectively as a community, then um, <clears throat> later when the model shop actually got more established is, you know, we in no way want modeling at Corgan to strictly be in this one room, this one area. We want it to be kind of a firm-wide, office-wide thing that occurs, you know, 
everywhere at desk level all the way to heavy machinery in a model shop. And, you know, one thing we're very big on pushing in, you know, the remainder of this year as well as next year's and stuff like that is to disperse that technology throughout the building and throughout the studio, okay. you know, really breaking down that barrier of people having to go off in this corner space or, you know, walk a mile to use one piece of machinery. Uh, we believe that for this to be, you know, an effective culture shift, we really need to bring those resources to the studio space, to the close proximity in which teams work and thrive. Okay. So, you know, with more and more things happening in VR and, and, you know, uh, so much, so much going digital, how do you think that, you know, works with the model space? Is that in contrast? Is that in partnership? I think it's definitely in partnership. I think what we've seen kind of in the late nineties and up until now is, you know, a somewhat digital revolution or really getting on board with this, you know, digitally saturated kind of arena that we find ourselves in, you know, companies and policies are continuing to push paperless and different things of that nature. But I think one thing that has been realized is we kind of lost the connection back to the physical, more tactile mm -hmm. world and nature of things. And so I think the benefit of that is it's kind of been identified and we're starting to reintroduce the physical nature into things, but at the same time, leveraging kind of what we've learned uh, with our kind of digital technologic advancements, you know, in the forms of machines are now more heavily integrated with computers and can drive some of these processes to free up kind of what would be a bottleneck in physical production time. Instead of having to hand tool everything, you know, you can send it to a 3D printer overnight and then the next morning go pick it up. And I think we're going to see the same thing in regards to VR. You know, VR is such an amazing resource and the fact that we can immerse ourselves digitally in this environment, see our designs to scale to some degree. But I think figuring out ways that we can add that physical aspect back um, in that one-to-one -one space, you know, whether it's building low little partition walls or poles so you can actually touch something in the VR space that grounds you, kind of makes it feel more real, um, is one aspect that those go hand in hand. And then another, you can just extend the lifespan of a model in general, where before models' lifespans might have been kind of, you know, this and then it just drops directly off once you get that one use out of it and it's kind of collecting dust over in the corner or you make a new one. Um, integrating AR technology to interact with that physical model introduces a new kind of dynamic nature to the model where you can push and pull, you can explode floor plates, you can add geometry, remove it, you can show different various options um, that integrate well with the addition of the physical that you've, you've created. That's awesome. I, I remember I was, I was up in New York a couple years ago. We were at um, another architect's office and that we were partnering with on a project and we got to go into their model shop and it was, um, it was, I remember cause it was, it was two guys there. They were unbelievably good craftsmen. They were very, very good modelers, but it was one of those things where it was very segregated. So when a project came in that needed a model, it went to those to those two guys and it kind of got on their plate. It was not something where the architects that were designing were doing any of the model building. It seems like with the initiative that we have with kind of getting it throughout the building, it's really opened it up for not people necessarily to come to you to build models, though I know you'll do that, but really more in, in a teaching and in a, in a mentoring role. Why is that important for architects to be able to have access to that in a, in a hands-on first person kind of way? Um, yeah, that's that's a great question and great point. Um, you know, we we definitely didn't we saw the value in just having the resources available, have one having someone staffed full time to kind of, you know, push this technology in direction to fabricate models to fix and enhance machines. But um, I think the greater thing is yeah, putting these resources and encouraging and supplementing the design process of every member in our studio. Um, you know, we're all designers to some degree, even though some people may not classify themselves that way sure. they are whenever they organize their pencils on their desk in a certain <laughs> way or different things like that. And, you know, when you put this technology as a resource into their hands, you don't have one or two minds really trying to cultivate and pioneer this idea. You now have 500 minds with different, you know, perspectives and approaches that can come alongside. You can grow. You've got a bigger kind of base to figure out, okay, this does work. This doesn't work. Oh, we need to fix this or that. Um, this is what we should be pushing, what we shouldn't be pushing, and ultimately um, in hopes that it just inspires and enhances our designs overall. 
in addition to the community of Corgan being, uh, you know, wanting the model shop to be a resource for, for that community, you had mentioned to me earlier wanting it to be a resource for the community around us. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so I think um, one thing that we're really seeing is some people are even stating that, you know, the next library is not going to be a place with physical books. Yes, it may have that, um, but we're already seeing digital books come online. And really what the next library might look like is a form of a maker space where you're bringing these technologies. It's kind of this big community center of, of new technologies and old technologies and how you can mix the two. And I think with that mindset, you know, we can really help communities out in various ways with these technologies that we're familiar with and able to pioneer, um, you know, whether that's community events um, or even things that Corgan is already a part of, like Parking Day and stuff like that. You know, we can fabricate that now in-house re really easy instead of having to, you know, disperse this randomly into people's houses and kind of try to truck everything over. Um, but I think, yeah, there's, there's just so many opportunities for community engagement assistance because, um, you know, not everyone might have these resources or the knowledge to utilize these resources in us. Us as designers, I think, goes beyond just buildings and structures. You know, ultimately, we're wanting to help the world around us and the communities and people that live and inhabit these buildings. And I think part of that is, you know, leveraging the resources we do have to find ways and areas that we can assist communities. In thinking through how design can really have an effect on a community, um, how has COVID given you opportunities for that? Yeah, so COVID, not, you know, in addition to us having the opportunity, but what, what essentially happened is, you know, this big pandemic that occurred around the world really caused a bottleneck to occur on the manufacturing of healthcare resources and PPE um, that they just weren't prepared for and that distribution that um, they weren't prepared to make. And so with that bottleneck, we found this large group and community kind of centered around DIYers as well as 3D printing companies that kind of looked at their resources and their available printers combined with, you know, the ability to digitally model pretty much whatever they wanted. And um, we saw this big push from the 3D printing companies with these different face shield designs that were completely open source. Um, you know, anyone could grab them, print them, use them, and really geared towards every individual with a 3D printer at the desktop level who started doing their own DIY things or just had an interest in it and optimized so that they could print this at a large scale distributed through the nation and world for whoever just had a 3D printer. Um, now there were other approaches where some people, you know, took those files and had lawsuits and different things that they had to work through. There's, there's, there was of course a lot of red tape, but I think the real big encouragement was, you know, as soon as these files got released as soon as the 3D printing companies were like, hey, you can modify these, please print them and give them out for free. Um, often they said, hey, only charge if you absolutely have to source new material and only you know, charge people a distributed amount to source that material to make others, um, different things of that nature. And the response of everyone was you know, pretty amazing in which thousands and thousands of shields were produced um, and architecture firms kind of around the community also circled back and, um, you know, reevaluated their resources and were like, how can we help? And Corgan was one of those, you know, we have um, eight 3D printers, we have CNCs, we have different things in which, you know, we do have a passion to help the community and serve those in need. And so we kind of um, evaluated those models, partnered with our healthcare team and our LA team um, to find clients and source clients um, to see, you know, who is in need, who can accept this, who, who wants this, because um, we're, you know, geared up and ready to go. We were already making prototypes at that point. Um, I think the encouraging thing there was there wasn't really a delay in our desire response. I got emails from Corganites, you know, every day almost about different face shields or articles or people doing this, which is really awesome because it just added to this huge kind of database of, you know, employees at Corgan want to help out as a whole and even upper management. It wasn't a question of, you know, oh, should we do this? It was how do we get this in place? How do we get this moving and how do we really push this? And so I think that was a really encouraging and awesome thing that we got to, you know, step into and really showcased how we could use our experience and our resources to enter into something like that to help out the community.
So you mentioned, you know, there were a few challenges in terms of, you know, legal. And obviously, if, if somebody is going to be using a face mask that you've printed, there is the expectation of a, a certain level of quality, which, you know, when you're a quality assurance in a DIY environment, is kind of a, you know, a mixed bag. Um, <laughs> were there, was there any consideration given to anything? You, you said that we did face shields. Is there, was there consideration given to anything besides face shields? Yeah, so the reason we landed on face shields, um, you know, many people were pushing printing respirators or other forms of PPE, but um, really the communal response and just those kind of more experienced with 3D printing um, didn't really advocate or push for, and this is the 3D printing companies largely as well, printing actual respirators just because a respirator is not an injection molding machine, or sorry, a 3D printer is not an injection molding machine. You know, it is a process geared primarily towards prototyping or, you know, sub 100 kind of prints, not for 500 plus kind of mass manufacturing um, scenarios. And as such, you know, it, it's additive, so it's got layers in it, especially your more typical desktop consumer grade printer that everyone's trying to, to use. And with that, you know, it's more porous. You've got, um, you know, kind of imperfections throughout the whole piece that you wouldn't want someone fully relying on as like a really good seal or protection against, you know, um, a virus such as this. And so what we found is we really wanted to step in, and this is what 3D printing companies were doing as well, in a way of supplementing N95 masks or really, you know, well-approved and tested PPE that will work. And it was more how can we use 3D printing to come alongside that and do more of a supplemental Thing, like a face shield and so um, that was really why we got behind that and wanted to push that and um, fabricate those as opposed to you know a direct respirator someone would use instead of an N95 mask. So how did you go about finding I mean it's one thing to make them and there's obviously a global you know, or certainly a national if not global demand for them but but actually physically getting them into the hands of the people that needed them how did you how did you find those people? Yeah, so a lot of that is, you know, kudos to our healthcare team and just Corganites around the office. Uh, we had a big push on, hey, find us clients. We've, you know, we figured out the prototype. We figured out kind of what we needed to get on our end legally worked out so that we're where we could distribute these shields. And then it was just like, okay, who, who are these going to? And we really found kind of a bottleneck on the other end as well in their legal systems and kind of insurance policies. You know, some of the bigger hospitals weren't necessarily keen to just outfitting all of their staff with DIY PPE um, and wanted it to strictly be, you know, certified approved PPE, which is understandable. And so we kind of had to branch out and find other clinics and specifically COVID testing clinics like Village Health Partners in Dallas um, or go through other resources, um, like with our LA team, uh, they looped in USC, who was kind of the middleman for distribution, collecting all of these different face shields um, from around the world, and they would sanitize them, put the visor on, and then distribute it to the clientele that they had. That's awesome. So you, you mentioned that you were partnering with uh, people in the LA office as well during this time, and it, it's kind of interesting to think about this as being something that can be distributed over a network. Yeah, so... I think that idea of a distributed network is kind of the key to all of this and how this became successful, really. Um, you know, if you needed everyone in one room to produce these things, it would have kind of bottlenecked really quickly and you were only going to get, you know, so much around in the QAQC, probably wouldn't have been there. Um, with the idea that everyone has these 3D printers, and for the most part, you've got, you know, kind of primary industry leaders in the desktop. 3D printer market. So you can optimize files for specific printers that people have or kind of take the other approach where you know they all function within this one little realm. And so you're going to make models and slice them in settings and everything that kind of catch all. And so in doing that, you really strengthen and are able to leverage your production through the use of all of these different printers that are kind of scattered across the the nation and the world. Um, and Corgan is one of those. We've got, you know, printers in multiple of our offices that we're able to utilize. And it's as simple as with the connectedness that the internet has provided, you know, sending digital files over that are already optimized and um, sending kind of what we've learned or what we've gathered or, hey, these are the materials you need. And even sending some of those materials over um, to 
instead of just fabricate all in one little hub, because you never know with redundancy, machine breakage, um, if someone gets COVID in that facility, then you've kind of lost all of your production. But there's actually strength in distributing this out and having multiple printers run from across the world. And it's very easy to do with um, you know, the new technology and internet connectedness and kind of um, video chat now that we're able to do and that's even strengthened during this um, COVID time we're in. It's interesting to think how this starts to kind of turn the paradigm on its head and, and you get all these people that are across the distributed network creating, you know, a product that's in need. Um, the, the, the consumers almost kind of become the producers at that point. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, we're seeing kind of two things with the availability of these industrial machines kind of, you know, being shrunk down both in size and power requirements, different things like that, um, to the consumer level being more user friendly so that people can get familiar with that. We're really seeing this increase in DIY maker maker spaces, hacker spaces, those kind of things where people can just fabricate what they want. They can design um, digital software is getting more kind of, you know, user friendly. Um, the interfaces are getting very, um, you know, easy to navigate and utilize. And so in a combination of all of that, you're really kind of entering this realm where people can produce their own things. And yeah, the consumer is becoming the producer rather than them being removed from that fact and just being an end user of whatever, you know, they desire or kind of wanting to get fabricated. Um, in addition, this whole process and um, these things, you know, in their nature and kind of entering into this field and using these resources really gives you a respect for the centuries of mass fabrication <laughs> yeah. and manufacturing that's already in place. You know, these people who churn out hundreds of thousands of pieces a day, whether it's, you know, metal pieces or injection molded pieces, they've got their QA, QC down, they've got their distribution down, all of their systems down. Um, really what this does highlight when you try to, you know, take a bunch of people that are kind of in the DIY world or, you know, have a couple printers in their bedroom or something like that, and they're trying to now mass fabricate as much as possible, you really see um, the limitations, but also it gives you a healthy respect for what's already <laughs> in place to get you that one product that you might order on Amazon or see at the store aisle. I remember you mentioned earlier this week that the the sticker that we normally just rip off, throw away, and don't think about that QA sticker. It gives you it gives you an appreciation when you go to pull that off for what's behind that little sticker. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You start to understand, you know, what fail safes are in place, what um, you know, insurance policies should we be covering with you know ourselves, but also what we put on the product that we distribute to users because there's just no telling how you know hundreds of users are going to use that product, whether it's the right way or the wrong way. You got to kind of think through and cover your bases, even if it's just going to be some little sticker that someone is annoyed by and rips off and rubs the residue off with goo gone or something. <laughs> so as we start to wrap up, what is what is your your hope or your vision for, for not just the model shop, but for how people interact with like physical objects? Yeah, so my, my hope is that, you know, we really leverage the strengths of both digital and physical. And I don't think they're completely separated. You know, we design digitally all the time in our software that, you know, will go into physical production via buildings and structures and furniture and stuff of that nature. And so they're definitely not removed. They go they go hand in hand. And my my hope is that, you know, if we provide the resources and capabilities to designers, to people in the world, just as we saw in COVID, that they're really gonna step up and be encouraged and utilize these resources to help out, to integrate digital and physical, to produce, whether that's you know software to 3D printer, whether that's model to AR, or all these various aspects. I think truly just giving them the resource and capabilities, making it more user-friendly, um, giving them close proximity, just empowering them to exercise their design skills on whatever level um, they can, I think, will give us a very positive response that doesn't only, you know, enhance the designs of the products that are made or produced, but it also just enhances kind of the coordination and connectivity of the world and also how we can support each other in times of crisis or times outside of crisis. Love that. All right. So before we wrap up, I'm just super curious. Do you have any of the, the prototype ones that you were working to fabricate? Yeah. So just over here, I've got um, one that we really based our design off of. It was a really 
Um, solid model by a printing company that I respect very much and one that we have multiple of their printers. Uh, made to be very durable. Uh, you can take it apart, put it back together. You can sanitize it multiple times. It's not just a one-time use throwaway. Um, at least that's what the company geared it towards. Um, in addition, it's got you know very basic parts. You've basically got four four parts where you have a upper and a lower 3D printed part that you see here in the orange filament, and then the other two is this adjustable elastic band to fit you know kind of multiple people and whatever user needs it, as well as this visor um, that just snaps into place. And yeah, all this all this stuff can just be kind of disassembled or reassembled as necessary, which is also beneficial for shipping purposes because you can flatten everything out yeah. and send it in a box as well as having to have these fully fabricated and kind of nestled together where breaking could occur and that's, during shipment. that company you were mentioning is Prusa, right? Yep, Yeah, Prusa. It's a great company. Well, Dylan, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate what you and, and the healthcare team, the guys out in LA, just everybody is doing to help support the frontline workers with these face shields. Um, and if you've been listening on the audio um, or the video podcast and you've gotten to see um, some of the images of both the face shield and of the layout of uh, the Corgan model shop, if not, double check in the description below. We'll make sure to have links there. Dylan, I'm hoping one small you know, silver lining to the COVID crisis is and being at home, I might have time to organize my garage somewhere nearly as cool as yours, but probably not. You have a lot more <laughs> tools than I do. Um, but thank you again for being here with us. And thank you for listening, and we'll catch you next time on The Square.